Here's what you've missed and what's coming up on Conspiracy in Canton. Officer John O'Keefe was found dead in Canton in January of 2022. Outside a home currently occupied by people known to O'Keefe. He was transported to the Good Samaritan Medical Center where he was pronounced dead. State prosecutors accuse Karen Reed, who was O'Keefe's girlfriend, of backing into him and leaving him to die in the snow. Reed's attorney says she tried to call O'Keefe and had no idea anything had happened to him. I think it's a terrible accident. It seems logical that police would have looked at Karen Reed as a possible suspect. One of her taillights had fresh damage. She openly questioned if she hit John O'Keefe and prosecutors say she left him a voicemail that night saying she hated him. I will tell you that my client has no criminal intent. She loved this man. They just seem to be in a happy place, you know. Reed pleaded not guilty to manslaughter, motor vehicle homicide and leaving the scene of a crash causing death. An investigation into the death of a Boston police officer in Canton has taken a turn. Lawyers for the woman under arrest not only say their client is innocent, but they're alleging a cover-up. They say there were a lot of people at the home that night, and one of them Googled how long to die in the cold hours before Reed would have known O'Keefe was missing. The lead detective is very close with the owners of that property. Prosecutors point to pieces of a broken taillight as evidence, but her lawyers argue the police report was all Altered. First got to that scene at 6 a.m. and did not find a single piece of taillight. And then 12 hours later, boom, they found taillight everywhere. Reed's parents and thousands supporting her say there's so much more to this story that doesn't add up. People in this town are scared. We know who did it, Steve. We know. And we know who spearheaded this cover-up. You all know. So listen up, sir. And I'll speak slowly so you understand. <laughs> We ain't got no quit. I remember watching a trial a while back where cell phone data was pretty much the star witness and key evidence in convicting a man for the murder of his former wife's new lover. The prosecutor spoke to reporters after the verdict. There were the proverbial attaboys and pats on the back of the prosecution team, congratulating justice being served and acknowledging the closing of a painful chapter for a grieving family. But when they asked him about a lack of physical evidence, he said in this case, as well as a lot of modern cases, technology has given investigators so much information that they don't need physical evidence in every trial. He compared cell phone data and technology data to DNA and fingerprints, but he said it's even better because not everyone leaves a fingerprint, but just about everyone has a phone. In the last episode, we started talking about some of the technology footprint and some of the battles the defense has fought in court trying to get more of it that hasn't been provided or some that seems to be missing. This week, I want to walk through some of the data and timestamps and what it means. We've gone over the statements, but like we've seen, witness testimony can be unreliable. I always say data doesn't lie. Sure, there are some things that are open to interpretation more than others. For example, phone location data can place someone's phone within a certain radius, but not necessarily the exact spot. Or security footage can show a car that matches the description, but without specific identifying factors, you may not be able to prove it's the suspect's car with certainty. Or there could be a Google search that has a timestamp of 2.27 a.m., And one side may say the reason is unknown, while the other side gives a specific explanation of why it's known. It's no secret that the Commonwealth and the defense have two very different versions of what happened that night and early morning. We've walked through the witness statements and tried to make sense of some of the changes, the inconsistencies, and made note of some of the things that were left off. All of these witness statements and the police and case reports were all done with limited data at the time. But forensic downloads of the phones of John O'Keefe and Jen McCabe, as well as information from the Lexus safety system, have now all been obtained and can hopefully help fill in some of the holes. Now, there's a lot of data, and if I try to just read it all to you, this will turn into one of those help you sleep podcasts as opposed to a true crime podcast. So I want to focus on some of the main data and how it's being interpreted, its reliability, 
what impact it has on the theories of both the Commonwealth and the defense. Data comes in different forms. Some things are pretty black and white, like video footage or files contained on a hard drive or timestamps on calls and texts. But some of it requires interpretation and explanation, and that's where the experts come in. We've all seen TV shows and movies with the dramatic scenes in the courtroom where the passionate prosecutor delivers the bombshell news that digital evidence puts the killer at the scene and then everyone in the courtroom gasps. Well, those are great Hollywood moments, but that's not how real trials work. In reality, the entry of data into evidence is usually not that explosive or exciting, although there are some exceptions. The experts come in to break down the information to the jury. For example, what each column means on a report, or the level of accuracy or precision on GPS data. You'll often hear the expert's testimony start out with listing off their credentials, education, training, and experience. Now this is really important, although sometimes it can be extensive and drag on a little, but it matters. The experts need to establish the qualifications that make them an expert so that the jury can decide how much credibility to give their opinions that they offer on the stand. The role of an expert is to aid in clarifying complex information or concepts and use their specific, technical, or specialized knowledge to help understand evidence and determine facts. The reason why this is such a big deal is that for all the data and evidence that isn't so black and white... Experts offer opinions to the jury, and based on their testimony during both direct and cross-examinations, each juror will have to decide how much weight that they give to that opinion. Does the expert seem credible? What if there are two different experts giving two different opinions? Which one seems to make the most sense or is most believable? In the last episode, we talked about differing explanations from each side's expert of the cell phone data, specifically the timestamp of the Google search for how long to die in the cold at 2.27 a.m. Now, this is the perfect example of a juror hearing two interpretations of data and having to decide who has more credibility or what makes the most sense. This is a case that's going to rely heavily on experts in multiple areas, one major area being the injuries obtained and what could have caused them. And that episode is coming soon enough. But the other aspect of this case that is going to rely so heavily on expert testimony is the interpretation of data. There are some data points that we can consider anchors, like timestamps on text messages and video surveillance. These are the ones that don't really require a lot of interpretation. There are others, like... Apple Health Data or GPS coordinates that leave more room for interpretation. I want to take all of the digital evidence that we have from all of these separate reports and put it together to see which theories fit and which don't. The information we're given starts earlier in the evening while at the bar, and we've already been over the basics of that timeline and what happened based on witness statements and what is reportedly observed in the security footage at Waterfall. I've made some graphics and charts to help organize all of that information in a timeline and make it a little bit easier to visualize. You can find those on our website at 13thjurorpodcast.com. There are also some graphics and information for the rest of the time in question that we're going to go over now, and those graphics can be found on there as well. The first block of time is the drive from Waterfall to Fairview. It's less than 15 minutes total. There isn't really much to debate here, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on it. Jen McCabe's phone shows her leaving the bar at 12.13. An SUV matching Karen's is seen on video surveillance en route to Fairview Road at 12.15 and 12.17. Jen arrives at the house at 12.18 and about 20 seconds later gets a call from John that she answers and they talk for 36 seconds. One second after that call... John's phone pings in the neighborhood for the first time as they missed the left turn onto Cedar Crest, which would have taken them to Fairview Road. They take the next left instead, and they make another left onto Cedar Crest. Once on Cedar Crest, Karen misses another turn. This time, she missed the left onto Fairview. They don't go far, just a few houses down, and then reverse directions, come back, and then make a right onto Fairview, at which point Ryan Nagel sees them, turns onto Fairview behind them, 
and they both pull up in front of Fairview Road about the same time. The next block of time is the most important one in the entire case. What happened during the time Karen's car was on Fairview Road is what determines her guilt or innocence. The entire case and the rest of her life are all dependent on these 10 minutes. First, let's take a look at the data interpretation and the theory that the Commonwealth has presented. This is what happened and when, according to the prosecution. To look at this, we're going to rely first on a report written by Trooper Nicholas Guarino with the Massachusetts State Police. I mentioned earlier that when an expert is giving his or her interpretation of data and an opinion, there has to be some sort of qualification period first. The U.S. Supreme Court has an established standard for expert testimony admissibility known as the Daubert Standard. It relies on five factors. One, whether the technique or theory in question can be and has been tested. Two, whether it has been subjected to publication and peer review. Three, its known or potential error rate. Four, the existence and maintenance of standards controlling its operation. And five, whether it has attracted widespread acceptance within a relevant scientific community. According to Guarino's report, he's a trooper with Massachusetts State Police for eight years, and before that, he was a patrolman for another police department. He has a bachelor's degree in criminal justice and mass communications, and of course completed his training with the police academy. Guarino says that he has received specialized training in electronic data recovery and analysis from the National White Collar Crime Center, and he has specialized training in the analysis and data extraction of cell phones using Celebrite, in X-Ways forensic software, Axiom magnet forensic software, and autopsy forensic software programs that analyze extracted data from digital devices. So what about the techniques he's using? Greeno says that he imaged digital evidence from, quote, numerous people in this case, including the victim, suspect, and witnesses, end quote. The only witness that I know that turned over any digital evidence is Jen McCabe, but he listed as plural, so I'm not quite sure why. Now, part of deciding how much weight to put on each expert's testimony is their experience and qualifications. I briefly mentioned it in a previous episode, but it's worth mentioning here. The interpretation of data that we are getting from this report is directly from tro Trooper Guarino. There was, of course, data recovered from Jen McCabe's phone by the defense expert that was not recovered by Guarino. This could be due in part to new software that wasn't available at the time. And also, the first time that Guarino sent the reader reports to the defense expert, he came back and requested for Guarino to send the raw extraction files for him to review, at which point he did. Now, as far as the GPS data, according to his report, Guarino says that he and Trooper Proctor went to 34 Fairview Road to physically measure the GPS coordinates from John O'Keefe's iPhone. Guarino says that he exported the GPS points from Axiom and loaded it into GPS mapping software that can view locations via a phone app. He says he mapped the GPS points starting at January 29, 2022 at 12.12.04 a.m. That location was actually at Waterfall Bar in Canton. He ended the mapping at January 29, 2022 at 12.25.36 a.m. outside of Fairview Road. Guarino said that he measured the location where John's body was found, and to find that location, he reviewed the Canton Police Department dash cam videos and the pictures taken by Sergeant Good when they were searching in the snow. The area that he and Proctor determined was the right spot to use is believed to be within three feet of the actual location of John's body, per Guarino. He lists the accuracy of the GPS points, and they range from 200 feet to 52 feet. And according to his mapping, he says there was only a three-second time period where John could have been in the house. That was from 1225 and 30 seconds to 33 seconds. He said the 34th second would include the front door, but not the house. 
Now, I know that this is a lot of detail, but it's really important because the experts for the defense and the experts for the Commonwealth have two very different versions of what they say happened. It's going to be up to the jury to decide which version they think is more credible or likely. I'll put copies of the maps with the GPS points that Gorino included in his Axiom Cache Locations report on 13thjurorpodcast.com so that you can take a look. The other information that we're going to use is from the crash reconstructionist. Karen's Lexus SUV was seized from the driveway of her parents' home in Dighton on January 29th. It was taken to Canton Police Department by tow truck. On February 1st, members of the Massachusetts State Police Crime Scene Services Section, a crime lab chemist, and trooper Joseph Paul of the Massachusetts State Police Collision Analysis and Reconstruction Section responded to the department. We're going to get into more of what they found with the car later, but for this episode, I'm going to stick to the crash reconstruction. Troopers performed some testing on Karen's car. They did a rapid acceleration, forward and reverse test with the vehicle and noted no deficiencies with the vehicle's braking system or other operations. They also placed a training figure resembling a human, about six feet in height, behind the Lexus. It was operated by one of the troopers and documented with video from crime scene. The vehicle was placed in reverse and started to travel toward the training figure. The camera within the vehicle was operating properly and displayed on the screen in the center of the dashboard and provided a 360 degree overhead visual. As Alexis traveled closer to the figure, both auditory and visual cues within the vehicle sounded off indicating an obstruction to the rear. So what this means is that the car was functioning properly. So if she were to back up and hit John O'Keefe, then she would have had warning notifications that she could hear and see going off in the car. Also, with the 360-degree view of what's around the car, she would have seen John on that as well. It seems like if there were this many alarms and warnings about hitting John O'Keefe, then if they believed that she did it or if she did do it, that would mean she would have had to have done it on purpose, knowing that he was there, or possibly have been too intoxicated to notice. But regardless, the testing shows that everything was functioning properly, so she would have been warned before hitting him. So now let's take a look at the Reconstructionist report. The report says that an extensive collision reconstruction was conducted, which included the retrieval and review of data created and stored by the Lexus safety system, including data of the vehicle's speed, distance of travel, triggering events, and the opening angle of the accelerator pedal. It says, based on a review of this data and other factors, The crash reconstructionist opined that the defendant's vehicle traveled in reverse for approximately 62 feet before striking the victim at a possible impact speed of 24.2 miles per hour. Post-impact with the victim, the defendant's vehicle continued in reverse before leaving the scene. Working in the true crime world, I've learned to question everything. The devil is in the details, and once I see that there's one thing that doesn't make sense, I have a tendency to pick everything apart. I trust raw data, and the anchor data like I mentioned earlier, the things that can't be disputed. But when it comes to the data that's left to interpretation by the experts, that's something that still needs to be questioned on all sides. In those cases, you aren't questioning the data, you're questioning the interpretation, and how they reached it. One thing that I noticed in this report is something that seems so small, but like I said, I pick apart everything. The conclusions that they reached are based on the data from the car and, quote, other factors. Now, if the data was reviewed along with other factors in order for them to reach this opinion that they reached, what are those other factors? Those seem like they would likely be important to know. And it's something that I'm sure the jury will need to know in order to determine credibility. So for now, let's put all questions aside and take a look at what the Commonwealth is suggesting based on their data experts reports. So here's their theory. Karen pulls up to the house with John O'Keefe in the passenger seat and they're fighting. 
She pulls up and the car doesn't actually stop until it reaches the edge of the yard by the flagpole. That's at 12.24 a.m. and 40 seconds. John O'Keefe exits the car and in her rage, Karen drives forward, 62 feet at least, which puts the car in front of the neighbor's house. She then puts it in reverse, reaches a possible impact speed of 24.2 miles per hour, hitting John at 12.25 a.m. and 36 seconds. She then continues in reverse after hitting him, then leaves the scene and goes to John's house. So, how does this theory hold up with what we already know and what we've heard? Let's break it down moment by moment. First, let's look at Karen's arrival and parking. Trooper Garino says that Karen pulled up and went to the edge of the property, the car not coming to a stop until it reached the area by the flagpole and fire hydrant. So how does that part line up with the other information that we've heard so far? Let's start with the Apple Health information. Step data on John's phone shows that he took 80 steps sometime between 12.21 and 10 seconds and 12.24 a.m. and 22 seconds. And during this time, it also shows that three flights of stairs were ascended and or descended. Now, since we know that that's about the time that they arrived, it would normally be a logical assumption that those steps would be John exiting the car, entering the house. The house seems to be on a very slight slope from where they parked, but not enough for three flights of stairs. However, there are stairs leading up to the front door, plus there are stairs when you enter the home that go down to the basement, as well as stairs that lead to an upstairs area. But the prosecutors say that John never entered the home, and the step data isn't accurate because the timing of it is listed at a time when the data that they analyzed shows John roughly half a mile from the house. In an opposition to defendant's motion pursuant to Rule 17 of Criminal Procedure directed to Brian Albert, Verizon, and AT&T, ADA Lally explains why he believes this health and location data is unreliable. Now, I'll be honest, I had to go back and read this multiple times to make sure that I was really reading this correctly and understanding that he was really saying this, but I'm going to read it to you now. Lally is explaining why he believes health data is wrong, specifically the information about the step data showing that Jen McCabe was up all night pacing when she got home. That's something that we'll talk more about in a future episode. But as his proof to the court that the health and location data is unreliable, Lally states, quote, Omitted from the defendant's motion is the fact that the same data relied upon for that supposition also reveals that Mr. O'Keefe presumably took 133 steps at 8.08 a.m., 68 steps at 8.25 a.m., 87 steps at 7.57 a.m., 81 steps at 11.06 a.m., 109 steps at 11.18 a.m., and 46 steps at 11.56 a.m. Mr. O'Keefe was pronounced deceased at the Good Samaritan Hospital at 7.50 a.m. End quote. So Lally is stating that the health data is unreliable because John's phone was recording steps after he had been presumed dead in the hospital. We know that law enforcement took possession of John's phone because they had it to analyze, That's an easy thing to find. It's documented in every police report, right? So I went back to double check to see who had the phone, who collected it. Obviously, whichever officer collected and documented it would be responsible for the steps being recorded as the phone is being transferred. I spent at least two hours going back through all of the documents and police reports and supplemental police reports. John O'Keefe's phone is not listed as being collected. I mentioned before, cell phone evidence is one of the most important elements in solving most modern cases. I was shocked that it wasn't listed as evidence collected from either search. Furthermore, the steps that were recorded during the times that Lally listed were interesting to me. The phone should have recorded steps when it was picked up, which, according to Jen McCabe, the phone was on the ground underneath John's body. The steps recorded on John's phone during that time are pretty consistent from right around the time that they arrived, actually. 
In fact, they are so consistent that it looks like the phone was picked up sometime between the time they found John and 6.11 a.m. And it moved pretty consistently until almost 8.30 a.m. with a few 5 to 10 minute pauses and steps in between. Now, after 8.26 a.m., there's no more movement until 11.06 a.m. for five minutes, and then a seven-minute pause, and then two minutes of steps, and then a 36-minute pause, and then more steps at 11.56. This is something that we're going to look more into later because it really piqued my interest, and I've been comparing the timing of those steps to the timeline of who was doing what and when. I wanted to know who had that phone. So you'll be hearing about this again. Now, obviously, Lally's explanation about the health data isn't accurate or even logical. And I've heard a lot of testimony in trials about step data before. For example, it was one of the key pieces of evidence in the Alex Murdoch trial. When it comes to this kind of evidence, companies will provide the raw data and also records custodians who will come to court and validate that these are authentic records kept during normal course of business. And then it's up to the law enforcement experts who attend workshops and do training to interpret those records. But the technology is very specific and it's constantly changing and it's very complex and that makes it difficult to interpret sometimes. And there will be different law enforcement officers and different experts who have different interpretations. So How reliable is this step data according to some of those experts? Here's Lieutenant Britt Dove explaining step data reliability during the Murdoch trial. Uh, In your opinion, what is the reliability? What do these steps tell us? Excuse me. It tells us that the phone recorded the steps. It's not 100% accurate as to that's how many steps were taken. Um, It also will not tell where the start was, the stop was, as far as distances, anything like that, but it's not 100% accurate. It just says the phone recorded steps. It was in movement recording steps. Okay. What kinds of motion can cause a phone to record steps? Possibly somebody was holding it in their hand, somebody had it in their pocket, but they were moving, they were actually in motion. They were either walking, could be running, um, it would record the steps, but if somebody's got the phone in movement, versus put in your cup holder, your car, and driving around, it's not going to record steps that way. Okay. So in your opinion, if someone puts the phone in a, in a car seat or in a cup holder and they drive, will the phone record steps? No, it will not. He also says that if there are one or two steps, then sometimes those won't be recorded. But any significant amount of steps will be. But in your opinion, can that move, phone move a short distance and not record steps? Yes, sir. Since it's not 100% accurate, you may have one or two steps that don't get recorded. Um, Usually if it's a large amount of steps, if you're 15, 20, 30 steps, it's going to record that. So this expert says that any significant number of steps, the example of 15 or more, will be detected. But if it's just one or two steps, it may not. In a study done by Netherland Forensic Institute to test the reliability of step data to determine value in a forensic investigation, three models of an iPhone were tested under a broad range of experimental conditions, including the carrying location of the phone, walking distances, walking speed, etc. The Apple Health data was compared to the manually recorded data, and the results of the experiments were similar for all three models with each subject. The step app data matched up with the manually recorded data with an average error of only 2%. That's pretty precise. But while the step data is that precise, the study did determine, however, the distance recorded with the steps varied more depending on a number of factors, including speed, walking style, and other factors that can actually cause it to deviate up to 30 to 40%. We'll be right back. So if the distance has that high of a variable range, it holds less value than something like the step data, which is much more precise. Because of that, the distance traveled data for this time period wouldn't be able to confirm or rule out the Commonwealth's theory. But if the step data is that reliable and it goes against the times that the Commonwealth are listing, which data are we to believe? And data isn't the only thing we have to compare during this time. 
Let's take a look at the witness statements. In Ryan Nagel's interview, he states that he actually turned onto Fairview Road behind Karen and John and pulled up to the Alberts' house about the same time right behind them. He states that his friend Richie, who was driving, stopped the truck directly in front of the driveway and Karen stopped along the side of the curb further down toward the left side of the property. He says that after talking to his sister Julie, who had come outside to the car to speak to them, he noticed that Karen had moved up a few further feet. Now, that's according to the report about his interview, but the statement of case changed his testimony from a few feet to one and a half car lengths. So what about Jen McCabe's statements? The version of events recorded for Jen McCabe change on different statements. Since none of them were recorded, we don't know if those inconsistencies were due to the law enforcement officers that she spoke to or Jen herself. But one thing that was noted on every statement was Karen's parking in front of the house and then at some point moving toward the far end of the property. In the January 29th interview, the PCA and the statement of case, Jen is listing as having observed the car travel along the road toward the left side of the property. However, in the February 1st interview, it is stated that Jen looked out the window a little while later and the car had moved to the left. But with every version, the car parked and then later moved. Matt McCabe's statement also says that he looked out the window at some point and Karen's car had moved to the other side of the property, approximately 15 to 20 feet. So that is three witness statements, all three witnesses that saw Karen's car that contradict the data given to us. So what are we to believe about this specific time frame? The three statements from the three witnesses and the Apple step data? Or the data given by the Commonwealth. Let's break down the next segment. According to their theory, after Karen parked at 12.24 a.m. and 40 seconds, John exited the car and Karen hit him and left him for dead. Their crash reconstructionist says that in order to do this, she drove 62 feet in reverse, and because of where John's body was found, that would mean that Karen would have had to have driven 62 foot forward so that she can then reverse to get back to the same spot to hit John. So this also goes against every witness statement. I entered the latitude and longitude given on the report of where they believe John's body was discovered within three foot variable, which is at the area in the front of the flagpole. I measured 62 feet distance forward from that spot, which would have put the car directly in front of the neighbor's house. When looking at Google Street View, there are trees that then block the vision of where the car is parked so that it can no longer be seen from the front door, which is where Jen and Matt McCabe said that they saw Karen's car when she moved it forward. So not only is this distance three or four times further away than what Matt and Ryan's statements say she moved, but it's also too far for Matt and Jen to have witnessed Karen's car moving. Let's break down the next segment. The Commonwealth's theory is that John O'Keefe was struck by the car at 12.25 a.m. and 36 seconds because they say it no longer shows any movement, and the phone was located underneath him when he was discovered. So how does this compare to all of our other information? At 12.29 a.m. and 44 seconds, Jen McCabe calls John O'Keefe's phone, and it shows an eight-second call that was answered. Now, the Commonwealth says that this wasn't really answered. It went to voicemail, and that's why it shows answered. However, there were 14 more calls made from Jen McCabe to John O'Keefe's cell phone that night, and not even one of them is listed as answered that wasn't. So it would be impossible for him to answer a call four minutes after Jen had struck him with her car and left him to die. Something else that contradicts this theory... Remember that statement from Ryan Nagel? Ryan and two other people are in a truck not far behind Karen's car. From one side of the yard to where Karen was said to have been parked to the other side of the yard where Ryan is said to have been parked is between 70 to 75 feet. Ryan says that he went there for about five minutes. His sister Julie came out and talked to them for a bit about coming inside, they declined the offer. She said that she was going to stay, and then she went back inside, and they left. So that's four witnesses that would have been right there. In order to believe this theory, you would have to believe 
that every statement given was incorrect. The Apple Health data is incorrect. The phone call that's listed as answered really wasn't, and it just happens to be the only one out of more than a dozen that's listed that way. And that Karen was able to pull up in front of the neighbor's house, then put it in reverse, come back, hit John O'Keefe, keep driving in reverse, running him over, and then pull away, all without the three witnesses in the car and the one witness outside of the car seeing or hearing anything. Also, Ryan Nagel said that when he drove off, Karen was still parked there, had no damage to her car, her interior light was on, and he didn't see anyone else inside the car. Also, the steps that are recorded at 1231 for John O'Keefe would have to be false. And Matt McCabe, Jen McCabe, Sarah Levinson, Julie Nagel, and Brian Higgins would all have left and not seen John's body in the yard, and Lucky the Snowplow Driver would have been wrong about being positive that there wasn't a body there, and if there was, that he would have seen it. Plus, all of the witness statements claim that they saw Karen pull up or saw her after she arrived, and then looked again and saw her sometime after that when she had moved. Ryan Nagel stated that they pulled in behind Karen and were there for five minutes, and when they left, Karen was still there. All of these statements would have Karen being there for, at minimum, five minutes. But, according to this theory, Karen would have done all of this within 56 seconds. That's a lot of things that have to be wrong in order for their theory to be right. So what else do we know based on the data for this time period? We know that at 1227, Jen McCabe sends John a text that says here with a question mark and an explanation point. She calls him for that eight second call at 1229 and at 1231, she texts him again and says, pull behind me. Then 36 more steps are recorded on John's phone. So three communications, each about two minutes apart, and then there's a 10-minute gap with no texts or calls between them. At 1241, Karen leaves John a voicemail, and in the voicemail, we know that she's made it back to John's house because you can hear the garage door and her heels on the floor as she's walking. Also at 1241, Jen McCabe begins almost back-to-back calls and texts to John's phone for almost 10 minutes. There are six calls and three texts. At 1240, 1241 and 10 seconds, 1241 and 59 seconds, 1242, 1243 and 19 seconds, 1245, 1246 and 16 seconds, 1247 and 52 seconds, and the final call at 1250 and 37 seconds. There's also step data for Jen McCabe during this time period. There's not much step data when she first arrives to the house and only four steps recorded at 1225, which is when they say John's phone stopped moving, so the time they believe he was hit. Ten minutes later, at 1235, Jen's watch records 148 steps during a 10-minute period. Now, this is kind of interesting because her phone only records 16 steps from 1241 to 1243, which is when four of those nine texts and calls occurred. So if she wasn't moving much when she was on her phone, only 16 steps, that means the other 132 steps that were recorded on her watch would have been between 1235 a.m. and 1240 a.m. So what about video footage? Ring camera footage would answer everything, right? Well, that's a whole nother fight. Karen's defense team filed a motion for order directed to Google, asking that the court issue a summons so that they can obtain information for any Google Nest cameras or associated accounts belonging to Brian or Nicole Albert for 34 Fairview Road. This is to include any setup information related to any Google Nest cameras or accounts, only the ones set up before January 29, 2022, and any service usage data for any Google Nest cameras or associated accounts. Also, any audio or video data associated with any Nest cameras or accounts between midnight and 6.30 a.m. on January 29th, and any records, logs, 
or other information documenting manual device interactions and or records of deletion of data, which was recorded between midnight and 7 a.m. on January 29th. Supporting facts in the motion state that significant reliable evidence has been obtained suggesting that other individuals were actually involved in the murder of John O'Keefe and the subsequent cover-up thereof. It goes on to say that the notion that longtime Boston police officer Brian Albert has no security cameras installed at the residence where he lives with his wife and children is hard to believe. And clearly, video footage will show if John O'Keefe entered the residence during that night in question or if he were struck by Karen's car. It goes on to read, quote, In spite of this very obvious fact, not a single police report or other item of discovery produced in connection with this case discusses whether there was video surveillance and or security cameras installed at the residence located at 34 Fairview Road. In fact, according to police reports, law enforcement never asked Brian Albert, Nicole Albert, or any other witnesses whether they ever observed video surveillance or security cameras installed at the Albert residence, located at 34 Fairview Road. Moreover, ADA Lally did not ask a single witness who appeared in connection with the grand jury proceedings whether there were security cameras installed at the Albert residence. In spite of the fact that law enforcement undertook no documented efforts to elicit this clearly relevant information from any of the witnesses during the course of its investigation, at the close of Brian Albert's testimony, a juror asked Mr. Albert, I don't know, but are there security cameras? Shockingly, before Brian Albert could respond to the question, Mr. Lally interjected, stating, let me follow up with that. So what, if anything, did you receive as a Christmas gift this past Christmas from your wife, Nicole, in reference to cameras in your house? To which Mr. Albert responded, I received for a present some type of camera. It's not a, it's not a ring, but something along those lines. It might be Nest or something like that. So Nest, I'm not positive of the brand name. But Mr. Lally then asked, And at the time of this day, January 29th, had you gotten around to installing that yet? Mr. Albert then responded, No, we never installed it. ADA Lally then immediately concluded all questioning of Brian Albert, stating, Seeing no other questions, I would thank the witness and ask that he be excused. This exchange is incredibly disturbing for a number of reasons. First, ADA Lally apparently had personal knowledge of the fact that Mr. Albert was in possession of a security camera before January 29, 2022, including specific details such as the fact that he supposedly received this camera from his wife, Nicole, for Christmas more than a month before Mr. O'Keefe's death. In spite of the fact that this information is not documented in any reports or other discovery that has been produced to the defense to date. Thus, at a minimum, the Commonwealth has failed to comply with its mandatory discovery obligation requiring the disclosure of all statements of persons the party intends to call as witnesses. Obviously, that was not done. Second, in spite of the fact that ADA Lally had personal knowledge that Mr. Albert owned a security camera on January 29, 2022, ADA Lally failed to elicit this information when he questioned Mr. Albert during the course of the grand jury proceedings. Significantly, this information, which was apparently known to the Commonwealth, never would have come to light if a juror had not independently taken it upon themselves to ask that question. In fact, Mr. Lally took the extraordinary effort of interjecting himself between the juror's question and Mr. Albert's answer in order to lead Mr. Albert into the answer that Mr. Lally had choreographed. Third, law enforcement was evidently aware that Mr. Albert owned a security camera on January 29, 2022, and yet never sought to secure that camera to determine whether it contained information of evidentiary value. End quote. So, no camera footage as of now 
to let us know what happened. And the way that all of this came about, that is a huge red flag. We have a lot of information and a lot of data to cover. So for this episode, we're going to stick to the time block of the bar up to about 1240, 1245 a.m., basically the time in question. Next week, we will talk a little bit more about the movements of everyone after this, including the step data with Jen McCabe's alleged pacing and the 2.27 a.m. Google search of how long to die in the cold, and Lucky the plow driver who said he didn't see a body but he saw a Ford Edge, and more of that. But for now, I want to focus solely on the two theories of this time period. We've looked at the Commonwealth's theory and compared it to other data and witness statements. Now let's take a look at the defense's theory and see how it adds up. In a defendant's petition seeking relief filed in September of 2023, the defense lays out their third-party culpability theory, implicating Jen McCabe and Brian Albert in a cover-up and involvement in the murder of John O'Keefe. The petition states that the injuries that John sustained, including blunt force injuries to both sides of his face as well as to the back of his head, are consistent with having been beaten and left for dead. It goes on to say that the defensive wounds on his hands are consistent with a fight, and there's also a cluster of deep lacerations and puncture wounds to his right upper arm and forearm. Dr. Frank Sheridan, a board-certified forensic pathologist and former chief medical examiner for San Bernardino County, says with a reasonable degree of scientific certainty, the injuries John's right upper arm, right elbow, and right forearm sustained are not consistent with being struck by a moving vehicle, but are consistent with animal claw or scratch marks. Now, this is something that we'll get into more down the road, but there have been previous filings from the defense about Chloe. Chloe is the German Shepherd K-9 that was a member of Brian and Nicole Albert's family for seven years. Now, a large part of the defense's theory is that the parallel lacerations on John's right arm are defensive wounds from Chloe attacking. Even though she was a member of the Albert family for seven years, she was suddenly rehomed four months after John's death. There's evidence that Chloe was involved in another bite incident following John's death, and there's testimony from Brian Albert that he had to put Chloe up that night and then let her out because she wasn't great with people. The defense says that when Karen pulled up, she waited in the car as John went up to the house to verify that they were at the right spot. When he didn't come back, she drove away in frustration, believing that he had gone into the party and left her sitting in the car. After she left, she called him multiple times and became more and more frustrated and angry that he wasn't answering, even leaving him voicemails yelling at him, and she even said that she hated him. The defense says that John's phone location data suggests that he did make it into the Albert residence. The location data shows that he arrived at approximately 1224, and he says that the Apple Health application data shows that he took 80 steps between 1221 and 1224, and also that during that time he ascended and descended three floors, then took another 36 steps at 1231. The defense says that this is clear circumstantial evidence that he did make it into the house. In the Karen Reed case in Canton, the killing that tore a town apart, Gretchen Voss writes that a friend of both John and Karen named Tom Betty informed an investigator for the defense that his daughter's friend, Colin Albert, the nephew of homeowner Brian, was actually at the house the night that John died, though he had not been mentioned on any of the previous police reports. That's not really surprising because there's a lot of things that aren't mentioned on the police reports until later. I mentioned in a previous episode that when Karen heard about Colin being there, she remembered a situation that seemed to create bad blood between Colin and John, but she said Colin was the only person who she said ever had any issues with him. So the theory from defense is that when they arrived, John went into the house. There may have been some kind of altercation between Colin and John. It's unclear if Brian Albert stepped in, but based on the injuries John sustained, they believe Chloe the German Shepherd did. 
When the injuries that John sustained were too great to overcome, he was put outside to die in the cold, and the family and close family friends who have inserted themselves into this case have worked together to frame Karen in order to protect Colin and the Albert and McCabe families. So how does this one add up? Again, we go back to the reliability of the Apple Step data versus the reliability of the location data. Both can't be true at the same time. The witness statements about where Karen parked corroborate this version as opposed to the other, and Ryan Nagel not seeing any damage to the car and seeing Karen in the car but not seeing John also does line up with this version. The timing of this makes more sense logistically because if Karen left around 1225 after hitting John with her car, she would have more than likely made it home sooner than 1241 since it's only about a six minute drive. The snow may account for an extra few minutes, but probably not enough to more than double or nearly triple the time. Colin being in the house is something that is disputed by the Commonwealth, although it was finally admitted that he was there, but claims to have left shortly after midnight before John and Karen arrived. Reports about Chloe having issues with people, and Brian Albert saying that she isn't really good with people, does support the defense's theory. And it's really hard to imagine just giving up a dog that's been a part of your family's life for seven years, just months after this evening. What about the cell phone data from Jen McCabe? Does it line up with this theory? Like I mentioned before, there are a lot of steps recorded on Jen's watch that aren't recorded on her phone during a five minute time span. Then she starts almost back to back calls and texts to John's phone. So does this support or contradict the defense's theory? One argument would be that she wouldn't be calling him and texting him if she knew something had happened in the home. Or, Is she calling and texting to create the illusion that he never came in and in case they end up checking her phone, which they obviously did, she would have this to fall back on? There are holes in this version also. If the GPS data has been interpreted fully and correctly, it doesn't show John going inside the house for long enough for a big fight. And the step data shows those final steps at 1231 to 1232. So if he was killed inside and put outside, how would the steps not have shown when he was taken outside? Now, if his phone was in his pocket and he was carried, it may not register steps because the motion wouldn't be the same and it may not set off the sensor. But if Guarino's report is the correct one, then there was no more movement on the phone after 1225. I mentioned before that Trooper Guarino's full file system Celebrite extraction report of Jen McCabe's phone failed to show any of the search history information entered by Jen, including the incriminating 2.27 a.m. search for how long to die in the cold. So if it was missing these things, could it also have been missing other location information or could there have been other mistakes or errors or things missed? So what else can we figure out from the data? What about the calls, steps, and video footage from after this time? Is Jen McCabe's phone data really that incriminating? What was happening with the step data on John's phone later that morning after he was found? And does the timing of these calls and steps have any correlation to Lucky the snowplow driver seeing a Ford Edge in the early morning hours parked in front of the Albert's home right where John's body was found? We'll continue comparing the data to both theories next week. My name is Brandy Churchwell, creator of 13th Juror Podcast. If you're enjoying it, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify and share this episode with your friends. For more information, photos, and episode guides, visit our website at 13thjurorpodcast.com.